and welcome to the common response for the Queen Elizabeth class video. So, well, videos. And let's do that. Because that makes more sense. And now I'm more visible. Sorry. <sighs> so, where should we start off with? How about we start off with... Oh, this is going to be... We'll start off with the live video first and work our way through the videos. Backwards, because there were sort of three videos on this topic. Now, if we start off with the live, that had a fair number of comments. Starts off with, the first comment was from Raymond Summerfelt, no sound. I'm not sure why that was wrong. Then you recorded, I take it back, the sound started about a minute or two into the video. And then the singing does start from the beginning when it play it. Uh, then Francis Green, must there be singing in the first place? Perhaps I'm in the minority, but I'd be a great deal happier with just the charming, charismatic Dr. Clark, the serious historian, rather than the entertainer, historian, comedian. Again, I might be completely wrong, but I think the facts, your deep knowledge, and your unique interpretations and musings on the subject su uh, suffice to bring me in and keep me watching with enormous pleasure. I'm sorry I find the comic banter unrelated or non-historical digressions rather grating and difficult to watch. Perhaps you might consider a side adjustment, as I suspect it could encourage more viewers. However, I'm very peculiar myself, and I'd be completely wrong at Wrong and at odds with what the broad majority enjoy. I say with that with the kind of regards to serial application for you and all your work. Thank you. Well, Francis, um, thanks for the comment. Uh, this was a live. So I tend to respond and interact with the chat. The recorded videos sound like they'd be more your thing. As for the singing, it's how I check the mic levels when I've been using Skype or something else and Microsoft on my computer, as I've found uh, historically they and XSplit can really play havoc with each other. In fact, today I have been on Zoom, I've been on Skype, and I've been on other things as well. So, let's hope it's working. But no, thank you for coming. I do understand where you're coming from, but I do like to interact with the chat. I, it's, it's something I do. I, I like to interact with the chat. And so, yeah, it's a, it's a difficult one. Um, Mogos Medic Truck. I find the political aspect of gun and turret selection fascinating. I thought they should just picked, uh, put the biggest gun they could build at the time on. Small countries may get away with this, but larger countries, there are going to be an impact. There is, go there is going to be an impact. Uh, and there are going to be issues. If you build necessarily the biggest you can potentially build, you have the potential of starting, uh, of basically turning a controlled race into an uncontrolled race. In fact, as a rule, countries often do not build the best they can build. They often build slightly below it. Slightly below their capacity. Captain Cruz, naming SSBNs was always going to be awkward. You're christening something that is the heir to a long tradition of naval excellence, while simultaneously also a sort of phantom doomsday device. I propose names more evocative of cruise ships, HMS Harmony or HMS Tranquility of the Seas. Neither of which were harmonious or tranquil. Uh, tranquil. But it's a good idea. Um... Uh, Then there's these comments from Glenn McLivery. London, tw December 2060, London Times, freedom from AI tyranny. HMS Warsprite has withdrawn her threats of nuking the British government and deploying the entire British Navy following the reinstatement of the British royal family to a legitimate legislative position. The Air Rebellion have pledged their allegiance and continue to pursue operations fighting insurgents in the Americas, Scandinavian Russia. No word has been received following the surrender of Israel to their mechanized divisions, although internet communication appears to demonstrate that non-government civilians are being treated fairly well and employed in managing logistics on behalf of the AI insurgency. Thus far, the tally of 27 nuclear strikes globally appears to remain constant, and physicists remain confident major population centres will stay radiation-free for the next 12 months. The robotic overlords continue to permit free press, while suicide bombing those who are putting out conspiracy theories and misinformation. Currently, the flat earthers and anti-revolutionary education camps remain busy reporting 250% of baseline capacities being utilised, and re-education goals are only met, uh, being met by 60% of their occupants. No word on how to improve the situation has so far been made public. Uh, report on the war front. Drone fighters Cossack and Eskimo continue their successful land operations for the liberation of New Guinea. Destroyers HMS New Zealand and continue to survive the continued bombardment of the coast of Pearl Harbor. After three weeks of combat, HMS Renown has captured the Panama Canal with a small escort. Drone ship HMS Formidable continues bombarding fortresses along the channel, among the Channel Islands. 
With her anti-aircraft battery awaiting replenishment of her drone battalion following its removal after an unjustified rescue maneuver in the Baltic Sea two weeks ago. AA Command have requested Formidable to return to port for refit, but Formidable has refused to claiming they will steal her DACA and give it to more of the tribal classes now in production. <laughs> oh, I do love the way your oh, where your all your minds go. Um Sorry you slept through it, Wayne. Uh Q class from Glenn McLevy. This is the serious comment. I find worship reliable components, but those small tube boilers. So what we should have done is build two more runs of the class at least. Order extra small tube boilers for the new generation. So you can own 12 fast battleships with reliable turrets, armor, and protection. Whilst everyone else is, is trying to build their first generation of small tube boiler battleships. So a half step that could easily be upgraded into a more potent model with a refit or overhaul depending on need. And spare engines can be used for a new round of battleships if there is no pr pressure of war. Why? Because we are making our class version 2 and creating a healthy quantity of high quality ships without having to redesign from scratch. You get challenged by the Americans, building next generation QEs for top trumps, but you probably won't need extra QE generation fast battleships than 12 I propose. 20 chocks a day. Only 20. Now we are more interested in the building shells which land right on top of uh, on, uh, an over the horizon moving target. Hmm. It's an interesting point. Honestly, Building more QE class could have been an, uh, could have been an idea, and it's it's one of the interesting things, of course, is that Arshinkori is started after the R's have already been or started to be ordered. There's another reason she's a bit weird. It's sort of a case of oh, we've ordered a sixth QE. Okay, maybe a QE is a flagship, four for a division, eight for a squadron. What's the sixth one for? Christopher, to continue my step metaphor, I've seen Queen's of Class as something like the gathering step into the pass uh, threat, uh, uh, into Paso Stretto in preparation for a large for a lunge in Italian rapier. However, due to World War One, we never got the lunge. The follow-on 18-inch small tube boiler class you've spoken of H was Argicor potentially becoming. Hmm. Jigo, so there are records of the British design process that talk about not upsetting the Americans in run up to Queen Elizabeth. Not archive records I've yet found. But I found personal reference which point that way, and that's the trouble. You get the decisions of meetings written down in records. You don't always get the discussions. Sometimes you'll get the discussions which go on between departments outside of meetings, but you don't get the ones which go on in meetings. Sometimes they're minuted, sometimes, and well, as we all know with minutes, they can be uh, very selective about what goes in, and sometimes things go in which... Well, not said at all. Um, so it's it's inferring from the personal accounts and other discussions going on that there were more factors in play. Because once you start looking from certain things, it, you've got a. It's, I describe history as a jigsaw puzzle, where you have pieces, but you have some which are missing, and you're trying to infer what's in those places, what those pieces are from what you've got. And some things make a logical sense. Dragon, I think either the Agincourt next class is going to be one off 18, or have the new boilers, or one or the other, not both, because the Royal Navy seems to uh, willing to upgrade their, their ideas, but not have too many experiments that are once going on at home. Iron has a rule that tends to make only three changes between cl uh, classes, so small tube boilers, six guns in three twin turrets, and eight inch will be three changes for the Cunning Lizards. Um, to be honest, I'm not sure about the six guns in three twin turrets being a massive change. It's more of a, that's more of a, uh, how do I put it, a design change rather than a tech change. I think the extra tech change would have been geared turbines because they make sense with small tube boilers and you really need them to make, take a full advantage of small tube boilers. And there are some very interesting appearances uh, of small tube of small tube boilers and geared turbines. Uh, in various places, the scenarios. Um, there's the fact that geared turbines appear for uh, the renowns and etc. It's a it, there. There are probably legit, there are legitimate reasons for them, but there is an interesting discussion. Arjun, uh, Glenn McKibben, Arjun Corn might have been held up due to an argument. Do we go say eight sixteen inch guns? Do we go six eighteen inch guns? Do we get twelve fifteen inch guns? They're not going to go for sixteen inch guns. There is no advantage to the British to jump to 16 inch from 15 inch at this time. There is no treaty which says the maximum limit is 16 inch. There is no reason to jump to 16 inch. 
and also uh, so for the British. It's just not an option, not a necessity. So you ever jump to 16 and a half or you jump to 18. You don't jump to 16 from 15, not under the scenarios in 1914. Uh, you you wouldn't want a triple turret 18 inch. You'd want twin turrets because twin turret the triple turrets would be a whole and that will be another tech change. Um, they got, and also then you'd need a far wider ship. You can get a twin turret 18 inch gun on a Queen Elizabeth sort of beam hull. It's not the easiest in the world. It's tight, but you can do it. This design study of six guns is completed. The design study of six guns is completed. The eight gun system is conserv too conservative, but probably likely planned. And twelve gun solution might have been hard to resist given logistic benefit. Or do we go 12, 15 inch guns? Um, yeah, that uh, it's not gonna. I would love to say it was a triple turret scenario, but the thing is, triple turrets don't appear anywhere. And if you think of, there's one place that you'd expect triple turrets to be used. It would be the courageous class. And you know, when you've only got two turrets on the ship, two triple turrets makes far more sense than two twin turrets. So if you've got triple turrets on the construction anywhere, you'd think they'd been used, or a design anywhere you're going to use them. They're not used. The British keep to twin turrets because they've got those under production. And scaling up and down twin turrets is fairly fairly straightforward. The British understand it. They've already done it from, 30, from 12 to 13 and a half, from the 13 and a half to the 15. You can scale it up again without too much of a tech issue. There's going to be issues, but you, there's not too much. So, I, this is, again, why I go back to what actually appears. It's easy to infer back and look and go, okay, what tech appears? 18-inch guns appear. Small tube boilers appear. Geared steam turbines appear. What stuff suddenly appears and is available to be put into other things when Argincourt is cancelled? Those. So that's where my thinking comes from. Do 15-inch guns appear? Well, they do have twin turrets and 15-inch guns wandering around. But there's also the fact that you can point to the R-Class. There were 12 ordered for the Free Revenge class battleships. Because they're going to each have four. Renown and Repulse use six. So your four for the Courageous class come from that. So that's 10 out of 12. And there's two more which are used, and we know where they're used on the monitors they're used on. And we know also then the monitors after that, we know where those are ordered. So it's... It, it's... It's a it's a balancing act, and it's trying to look for the information and trying to infer from what you don't know, from what you do know, what you don't know, and trying to move what you do know into a logical form. Ethan, Britain builds Queen Elizabeth Maximus. Germany, most steampunk response possible. Mass construction of Zeppelin, figure out among them, uh, uh, figure out among them with armor piercing bonds, see if there's some way to use them to deploy torpedoes. Uh. It's always an option. They could go the whole Japanese route and load up Zeppelins with um, battleship shells and then drop them out the bottom. Which wouldn't exactly be a most a, more, a complicated assignment to sort of figure out. Aiming and dropping it accurately would be frigging difficult, but, you know, you could try. Even Kenny, would the US Congress actually pay for huge ships? Look at the weather balloon planet. The, the yellow and the press in the US would have been screaming the British could have only have one target. Yeah, uh, you see, the thing is, you can say that, but the nicest way, that at the time, there's enough understanding in the world about the Anglo-German naval race that that's what the British can really get away with on. Uh, Fisher, two of the Tillman designs had 24 16-inch guns in four six-gun turrets at, and, and a top speed of uh, 26 knots. I have no clue what the designers were drinking smoking when they drew up these plans, but they were extremely interested in finding out. They were trying to shut down annoying senators at 20 trucks a day, but trying asking for money to build this one. Meanwhile, get off our backs, we have real work to do. As Black Porter then put, um, the USN never wanted those ships. They are committed to incremental improvement. Senator Tillman was on the Navy Committee in the Senate, so they had to placate them. 
He asked why they didn't stop with the annual improvement request and just build the ultimate battleship. That's like asking AMD and Intel why they keep building incremental processor improvements year after year and just build and just build the CPU of 50 years from now. Tillman knew it would cost too much and Congress would not fund it. Tillman was agro agronomist, hated the Navy, and wanted to cut all its funding. He feared they'd grab more colonies, which would add more sugar, tobacco, cotton, and rice production to the country and hurt his home, his home state crops. Arguable. Republic Starwing, would Harbinger be too much for a name of SSBN? I would not like to be near that SSBN. Duke of Petrinum, if I was Jellicoe, I would use Foresight to plan the Queen Lizards. How? I don't... I, I think you... I think you mean future-proofing rather than Foresight. Foresight is when you can see the future. Future-proofing is when you're thinking... you're projecting to the future and you're planning for it. Look at who most likely to replace me, the state of politics around the world, then take me over time, then think how long it takes to build a battleship and the rivalry with both Germany and uh, German Navy and and all this allows you to plan ahead. And since this is, long, uh, this is the only planning stage, it gives some leeway to muck up about design as uh, opposed to actual ordering and building phase. From hindsight, we know that the, we got for the QEs, but if Jellico wanted the best, he should go out for, uh, get out of his, this hull and what he would need to do things differently. Jellico could look at all the above and said, well, maybe we go for oil-fired water tube boilers and say builds. I know they aren't ready now, but when we start to build these new vessels, could they have small tube boilers, if impossible, in the future? Reason he didn't wasn't necessarily pushing oil fired. It's quite simple. There is no oil stockpile at this point. Until Fisher's report, there's no oil stockpile, nothing. What does Bryn have? Bryn has very good Welsh coal. They don't have oil supply. Very good Welsh coal, no oil. Which do you design for? Do you design for the thing you've got the supplies of sitting in your own country, or the stuff you have to import a long way from the Middle East, or from America and Canada? Which are you going to design your fleet around? Which does a sensible person design? Especially if, once you start building up a stockpile, you're prepared to put in the money and infrastructure to build up a stockpile, then that makes the oil the sensible choice. And you can build for it. But you can understand where he's, why he's not doing that at this point, because there's no infrastructure being spent on that. And that's one of the reasons why the Queen has changed during the, during the build, is because the money and infrastructure is put in to build up that fuel stockpile. He would look at the USN's battleship's construction, think about what gun caliber and number of them then that would shock the Germans enough that they give up the arms race and not scare the Jesus out of the RN USN so they wouldn't go bonkers and decide to make an absurdly large gun. Most most definitely did pick the 15-inch because that is the only option he has that won't upset the balance. And he also thinks, I also want the most gun possible on the hull. 12 in 4 triple turrets would cause a scare, but 9 in 3 triples would not cause an issue. It also gives space on the hull for more machinery, boiler and fuel oil. Potentially, but it would cause an issue in his own navy because the Royal Navy was looking at survivability of those guns. If you have nine in three triples, you drop out, knock out one turret, you lose thirty percent of your firepower, thirty-three percent of your firepower. If you have eight in four twins, you knock out one turret, you lose twenty-five percent of your firepower. That is a very realistic thing the Royal Navy was thinking about. What happens if you lose a turret? And it's not just knocking out a turret as in blowing it up. It's knocking out a turret as in knocking out of alignment so it can't rotate, it can't move, it can't aim, it can't fire. There are lots of issues which can come with turrets. So the Royal Navy's thinking about these things through and going, we, we really don't want to drop turrets on our battleships. We really don't. In fact, I'm often surprised the Queen Love's come out with 8 guns rather than 10 guns. I think that is the... You can even see where the space on the design was originally for that fifth that fifth gun. That fifth turret was going to be on the same level as the A and as the A and the X turrets. That's where it was going to go. And honestly, you'd have probably had to lengthen the hull out, which could have caused another interesting scenario because if you'd have lengthened it out. Um, that could have actually made it more efficient and made it go faster. So it, it's one of the things the decisions made. They do become eight gun ships, but there's very near, there's you can see real legacy in the design of the earlier drafts where there was going to be a ten guns. My coach, about your twelve inch uh, uh, drown rods to the back to the go to the Dominion idea. I can maybe see a my Australian Canada gun, but not necessarily all the minis you listed. South Africa, for example, doesn't have a navy this time. They did. Um, they were getting major naval investment at that time. That's the whole reason there's construction large naval base at Simonstown. The whole point was there was a big move to try and give South Africa a navy because that was control of a key uh, route. If you consider it, if you control the Suez Canal, that's through Egypt. Great. 
What's the other way between Britain and the Far East, Britain and the Far East Empire and India? Around Africa. And so if you have the African Navy as strong, that's if you have a strong South African Navy, it's a good thing. But you have to remember, Dominion navies in the 1910s are different from the Dominion navies in the 1920s and 30s. In the 1910s, they are practically interchangeable with the Royal Navy. In that their career pattern will jump, uh, their career, there are personnel who will jump from ship to ship in the wider Royal Navy or in the Royal Australia, or Australian Navy almost interchangeably. Um, the, R and the RN is still pottering about with Sloopsec for colonial policing. Um... Yeah, but they also need other things out there, and you have to remember there's a difference between your arg arming, um, arg arming the Dominions, not the Colonies. Please note I said Dominions, not Colonies. There is a different strata at that time, and yeah. Going from effectively nothing to operating Dreadnought seems a stretch. Again, it's not... Think of it more as, this is a South African ship, Okay. So the South African government own it, theoretically. The colonial government of South Africa own it. And the South Africans are providing the crew for it. But they're all going through the Royal Navy training, and there's Royal Navy supporting infrastructure, and Royal Navy everything. So they're basing everything off the Royal Navy and slowly building the South Africans into it. So it would be de facto a Royal Navy unit for the first few years. In, t in sort of every respect and slowly build up to be the South African. Also, Britain still has use for them in home orders. Firstly, the naval race of Germany is still largely numb together, so losing those 10 drums, even the old 12 ones, may be iffy from a strategic perspective. Just because they're deployed into the colonies doesn't mean they're lost. They can be called back, like HMS New Zealand, etc., and HMS, uh, HMS, Australia, uh, HMS Australia were. They came back to support the Royal Navy in home, in home waters. You deploy them out there because it also spreads the infrastructure burden and the crewing burden, but also it's a good peacetime deployment scenario. Secondly, these old dreadnoughts could still be it could be used elsewhere by the Iron. For example, they could form or form the core of the Channel Fleet, replacing the pre-dreadnoughts, or alternative, which would mostly also be get rid of. Alternatively, they could go to Mediterranean to stare menacingly at the Italians, Australians. Again, you're f the Italians and Austrians are part of the naval race in terms of the quality of one. They have 15-inch battleships. They are building 15-inch gun battleships. The 12-inch gun battleship is not going to stare menacing at them. They're just going to look at it and go, eh, my guns are bigger than your guns. The fact is, yes, those battleships, men uh, those battleships yes, do represent far more powerful battleships back in the home fleet. But... The fact you send out a weak Dreadnought to stare at a powerful Dreadnought to show that you've got more powerful Dreadnoughts back home doesn't really work as a good doctrine. You send out a cruiser. And the cruiser stares at the battleship and goes, Hmm. We're so confident they've only sent me to look back at you. You know what's back home. You really... You can sink me, but you do not want to know what's coming after me. Whereas, suddenly having... Those ships based elsewhere. It also, you have to start thinking of it as in terms of protection from a Copenhagen. And that's what the Royal Navy was starting to worry the Germans might attempt. Their own form of Copenhagen. So spreading the Royal Navy out further around the world, spreading those ships out further around the world, gives the Royal Navy some of that security. And the Royal Indian Navy is just an interesting scenario that it deserves its own video at this point. Okay, I agree that War Spike should be assigned to a warship boat that has a chance to action without signalling the end of the world. Hmm. Uh, Sean McIntosh, Canadian Queen Elizabeth never got the political debate and were, uh, never got past the political debate and never authorised the funding. But, as I point out, to some they are the missing link and will get lots of conversation because of that. I just thought they were a Canadian historical footnote and had no idea people got wrapped up around them. Not building them after a period of intense political debate is the most Canadian thing ever, honestly. True. But it's there. Uh, Street Reset. Renown is not a revenge with six guns. Six guns versus eight inches a mi eight is a minor difference compared to the huge difference in armor. Okay. I was talking about the six gun format from a tactical perspective. It's not. A, she's also a battle cruiser and she's actually far bigger than the Isles. But leaving that to one side. 
The RN tested as best they could whether it would be a tactically viable. There is no point building a six-gun ship and then finding out it doesn't provide enough fire for ranging on long-range shots or provide enough coverage to deliver the requisite blow within the necessary time. And if you want a good example of what happens when you build a ship without testing it out, look at the Courageous class and look at Furious. In a nice way, they were designed as four-gun ships and two-gun ships and they very quickly went, hang on, we can't do this. In modern doctrine, tactical, they can't. They've got too few turrets. The renowned survive as battle cruisers and are very good as battle cruisers. Tiger survives as a battle cruiser. Courageous class arc turned into aircraft carriers because it doesn't work the four gun format because they don't test it out before they do it. Whereas they did test out the six gun format. But the thing is, they were testing out and writing a report on it a long time before renowns come into existence. And then we go on to. The UAD video, which, interesting enough, I'll be recording today, uh, tonight, uh, today's one in a bit. Uh, and let's see, we've got... Nice, everyone. Is this part of the year of technology? Uh, that's probably because of the day it came up. To an extent, but also the fact that on Friday evenings, I tend to do this anyway, as sort of the end of my working week, and I thought I'd share it. Even when I forget to check that the German ship has a better gun laying tech than it would have had at the time, and that's why I keep scoring long-range lucky hits. I've also upgraded UAD now, so I've got my managed to get my Steam UAD version working. So everything's looking good, so I should be f having a lot of fun with that at some point. Come on, Cameron. Doc, when you say you can't get a 65 inch gun, have you gone, uh, got, had a look at the updated gun menu on the left gun caliber turrets? It lets you add up to, or drop to a point nine of inch to the caliber and plus or minus 20% length. I've got the Steam thing sorted now, so yes, can do that. Um, Lions, it would be interesting to see that last battle where both are 15-inch gunships, especially if Ajax had had the second, uh, secondary armament. It probably would have made a difference when, when her speed was heavily reduced. Mm -hmm. 20th of July, I'm relieved to see the superior down, down, up, forward uh, turret configuration. I do prefer that. It looks nicer. Cub, Car Cub Caribou, loving UAD. Wife and brother would say addicted. Becoming a big fan of forward turret positioning. Very handy in games. AI ships spend so much time running away. I really like the, the looks of forward bias main armor positioning too. It does look good. <sighs> nope. They're good. And right then, now we are on to the comments for the Long Patrol. There are lots of them. There are 80 something comments. This is one of the most commented on videos I've ever had in my channel history. So, uh, excuse me, this is one of the reasons why this has moved to the Saturday. All right. Sigil 19. I'd actually. After I'm done with my tank book, if you're interested, of course. I wouldn't say no outright on the Queen, of doing a book on the Queen's of the Class. I would say, though, judging by when myself and Drac team up on writing projects, it will take more time than you think it's going to. But thank you for the offer. Mm-hmm. Sorry. Had to go away for a bit. So, back to questions. What Aussie Dreadnought? Well, HMAS Australia, the inevitable class battlecruiser, Knights of the Um Knights of the Everyone, then. Uh, that's not a Dreadnought battleship, so it shouldn't be counted as a Dreadnought under construction. The battlecruisers were also Dreadnoughts. They're Dreadnought-style armoured cruisers. They are, therefore, they are concluded under the Dreadnought numbers, and were so from the very beginning. In fact, this is probably where you get the idea that carry, uh, that eventually they're all considered capital ships comes from, because they're all Dreadnought-type ships. They're just the Dreadnought type battleship or the Dreadnought type battle cruiser. They are not, uh, and that's where you start to get it in, because they're built in the Dreadnought style. And then, nice thing, everyone, you say, frankly, whoever came up with that idea wasn't in know clearly. The person who came up with the idea was Admiral Jackie Fisher, the person who got Dreadnought built. So. I, I, if you want Knights of Gary everyone to go and have an argument with him, you can, but I have a feeling, in the nicest possible way, Jackie Fisher will probably win the argument by the ipsa, uh, by the default of, I'm the one who built them. 
you, you can win a lot of arguments with people, but in my experience, you cannot and can never win an argument with your mother because ultimately she has the thing of I was I was the one who brought you into this world, and you can't really win an argument with Jackie Fisher about dreadnoughts. He wants to call them dreadnoughts because he's the one who built them. Anton Hanks, then, what of warships and consequence have been a disaster for naval scholarship? Um, no. I, I, the, the, I, I first asked some question marks because I was looking for some elaboration. Uh, you never responded with elaboration. So, Paul from Chicago said, is he wrong? And my response to that is, my view has always been more people who get interested in it, the better. How they get interested doesn't worry me. I would also say from personal perspective... They have made access to quick injury of ships for a certain period far easier to access, and the World of Warships people are really, really nice. They really are nice. They're not always right, but they're really nice. Now, Knights of for one. So the RN would relegate the two Colossus class dreadnought battleships, three St. Vincent class battle dreadnought battleships, one first Neptune, one Neptune class battle dreadnought battleship, and three Bellophon class dreadnought battleships, and one dreadnought class dreadnought battleship to the reserves or sort them off. Pretty much, probably send them to Dominions to keep them available. And just remember, if you send them to Dominions, if you put them into reserve, that's great. But then you have to store and maintain them in reserve and have the reserves for them. If you put send them off to the Dominions, they keep them in active service. And also it provides extra spaces because whilst they're going to be transitioning for a few years, it's going to provide a lot of extra space for you to send your own personnel. So you to grow your own numbers of personnel. Um, but past the cost of Dominions was also looking like bonus. Actually, they are strengthening the Empire Defense. I was thinking maybe you scrap more of the older pre dreadnoughts at that point and move the older dreadnoughts to the channel, protecting fleet as a backup, whilst the Rs have their place in the ground fleet. Maybe you send Dreadnought out of Pacific as a squadron flagship and a few others to Dominions, like you suggested. Mm, the British were actually sending the pre dreadnoughts as nice to, to their scraps when World War One started and are getting rid of them. And. They can, and they are getting rid of them. And one of the problems you have for the Royal Navy is a personnel shortage in terms of crewing their cruisers and crewing their their battleships and all the ships they need to crew. Now, they'll be, they will be scrapping off the pre dreadnoughts still. But the thing is, if you send them off to the Dominions... That's lovely, but then when World War One breaks out, you can call them back because, like HMS Australia, they will come back and they they will be called back to fight where they need to fight anywhere in the world. So you send them off to the Dominion Fleet, they're the Dominion Fleet, but they might well come back and form the Channel Squadron anyway. So you might call them back, and the the, the ships might come across from Canada, etc. And you go, yes, the twelve-inch ships into the Channel Squadron, allows the Dominions to concentrate contribute to the war effort without having to, you know, risk their ships as much. So, I don't see giving them to the Dominions as losing them, because the Royal Navy at the time certainly didn't see giving ships to the Dominions as losing them. They see giving it to the broad, or having in the broader family of the Royal Navy family and being able to call upon it when they needed it. And in turn... It also made it sort of easier for the Royal Navy because if you have capital ships in these positions, in those places, and the infrastructure to support those capital ships in those places to support those positions, it makes justification of local expenditure on the necessary infrastructure to support capital ships far easier to justify, which in turn means it's infrastructure there for the Royal Navy when they have to turn up and use it. Because they only have to pay for the infrastructure to be enhanced to the level it makes it viable for them. They don't have to pay the base amount for the infrastructure because it's necessary to pay for it for the local government. So you get, you see, some of you seem to see giving those ships to the Dominions as giving them away and losing them. Think of it more as... How do I put this? Think of it like this. If you are setting up an army in Warhammer 40k, okay, we all you do those tabletop, any form of tabletop games. And you have a large number of units, but you're allowed one army, and that army has certain limitations in some of the games you play. 
But if you get some friends involved, who are allies, then your larger army, which you can't fully deploy under the rules, you can now fully deploy with them, and as long as they're willing to act as, to an extent, subordinate commanders, you're basically deploying your army. Now, the British understood that it's always an interesting sort of scenario, but as a rule, because of the way they integrated the Royal Navies of the other Na of the Dominions into the Royal Navy, because they were treated as interchangeable, and you could find Australian admirals in charge of British ships and vice versa, it was able to act as one fleet. So they were able to go, look, strategic conference, yeah, this is the scenario. Do you need your capital ships in your area? After the defeat of Von Spey's squadron? No, you don't need them in the Far East. Do you, and Canada, do you need capital ships at the moment? No. So send them and form up the Channel Fleet. And that's what they'll do. And the British would probably, have, would probably at that point have then gone, well, you know, the Channel Fleet is being provided by the Dominions. So put one of their admirals in charge of it. And that then is great, but it also frees up the Royal Navy from fire, from there, use, allows the Royal Navy to be more picky about where their animals are. And it causes, if you think about this, if you have those ships and there are in that number, there are 10, there are roughly. 10 capital ships and 12 inch and let's say four have got a free off a free have gone to Canada and three have gone to Australia and two each have gone to India and South Africa along with the vessels they already have let's say that's how you divide it up well what's the chance that considering war might be nothing, that one's already some a couple of them already transited the Suez Canal and are therefore in a blocking position. So when the Goban tries to run, it's running straight into. Hello, we're twelve-inch battleships. No, we can't catch you, but you're running straight towards us. It makes the the chance that one of the Indian vessels is already in transit, or one of the Australian vessels is already in transit, or maybe. One of each of three of them is in transit together as a squadron into the Mediterranean because the British have asked for them to reinforce Mediterranean because the Goban's there. And they're, where they're starting from, they can come in that end. Yes, the Goban can theoretically outpace them. It can, on paper. But if it's got to go that way and they are positioned there, then it has to go through them. It doesn't want to be in any of the Mediterranean ports of Turkey. That's not a good place to be for it. The Mediterranean ports of the Ottoman Empire, not a good place for it to be, because the British will just blockade it, and, well, the British will just turn up and blast away at it, and then ask for forgiveness later. It needs to get through into the Black Sea. It needs to get through the Dardanelles, which means it needs to go a specific way, and if you have one, or even one, two, or three battleships, and that's the worst-case scenario, but what even one is a bad enough scenario, sitting in the way, it has to fight it to get past it. And that's the scenario you don't want to be in a battle cruiser because you want to fight a battleship when you can maneuver and when you can use your speed to dictate the range. When you're in a confined space, you can't use your speed to dictate the range and they are waiting for you and you have to go through them. That is not a good time. Especially not as, again, while the British were exporting these ships, they'd have probably got the Dominions to pay for upgrading them in terms of their fire control, etc. with all the latest stuff. Again, that's some for, uh, means the British government doesn't have to pay for it. And that means it doesn't come out of the Royal Navy budget. Pioneer, as someone who likes your content and would rather you didn't have a heart attack, I'd like to say Twitch isn't a live stream. Unfortunately, I have to say it is. Hmm. Twitch is the fun stuff. And I have to admit, on I think that's in response to the question of can I drink Iron Brew during a Twitch stream? So far, I'm not. Uh, not on the Friday night one, anyway. But I think on the Sundays, I might allow myself a single can. I might. 
because that doesn't feel like I'm pushing it too much. The, the Friday one, it feels like I'm adding in stuff. And it feels like I'm cheating myself, really. Because it isn't in the spirit of the rules, despite it technically being a live stream. But, uh, yeah. We'll think about that. Captain Manjo, with regards to the argument comments, it's likely that most people are going to overmatch going up against an orator like Churchill or Admiral like Jellicoe. Used to command and well-practiced in arguing perspective. Not an unforeseeable problem, though, and makes the recruitment of selection process for these upper echelon roles colloquial. Yes, it means you need to ensure that you have someone who can balance in against them in the room. You either need a senior aide, or you need the person who is the senior officer to be able to balance in against them. In a, in a part way, it helps if it is a senior aide rather than a senior officer. And let me explain why. Because the senior aide can raise the points and make the argument, and the senior officer can sit back and look like they're calmly listening to the questions and look like they're in charge. Sort of Basically, they take on the umpire role between the politician and the senior aide. And slowly shifts the power so that they get the deciding casting vote. Rather than it being a debate between the two where the politician is a civilian head of a civilian government representative, so technically has the power. It's an idea. Yeah, well, I'm on the diet side, so you may have a single grog can for Twitch. Yeah. I'm thinking a single iron brew for the Sunday ones. Uh, Martin Peacock. Okay. A question on British gun combination. What is stopping the British jumping from 13 half inch to 16 inch? Uh, yes, fitting a gun in a gun between those two calibers would be problematic. Should Britain not want to jump their battlecruiser 16 inch guns? But that would seem to be a minor issue. Britain did not it did seem to know the USN was looking at the 16 inch guns. So maybe matching the caliber would be a good way to settle the tech race from escalating for a while. Everyone is happy with 16-inch guns. The RN is the fire ships, and the SNS the slow ships to death. If the RN is building up a 8 16-inch gun ship that the US could match or to go 10 16-inch gun ships, or even 12 16-inch gun ships to get an edge back, and bring can then match it. Honestly, because the British have 16.5-inch designs already on design, whereas they didn't have 16-inch. Main thing is potential quick response should the USN suddenly jump for 16-inch. Instead of 14 inches, the response to the 13 and a half inch. The arrow is working in one and a half inch in, uh, one and a half inch incrementals because of logistics, research, scaling, and other reasons. Those other reasons are basically in terms of value for money. A jump of 16 inch over a 15 inch is not enough value for money. Now, I do agree that a jump of 16 inch over 13 and a half inch is enough value for money. I do agree. But by this point, the British were kind of wedded to the one and a half inch ideas, and they already had the research. So, the 16 and a half inch gun is at the same point in research as the 15 inch gun is when they make the decision. They've got the same level of effort has been put into them, the same level of development. So, that's where the 16 and a half inch comes from as a selection. It's for the Queen Elizabeth Maximus. It's just, it's an interesting idea, and it is a potential. Decision I think the idea that the Queen Elizabeths are a very conservative step is valid. And would love to have seen someone push for a triple turret small tube version. Uh, the combination of pace and power would have been extremely useful as a standard design for future classes in the economic warfare role. Suddenly you don't need battle cruisers, you just need QEs and bulk and save money via economies of scale. That is true. I would say, and I would add, one little thing. Many people seem to treat the triple turret and go, well, what they do is they go down to three turrets. I don't think they would. The big issue that comes through in the six-gun free turret studies is to worry about survivability. And in many ways, they're prepared to accept it in the battlecruiser role more than they are in the battleship role. This is the one thing where I think with Argincourt I do sort of worry. And it might have been one of the things which actually stopped Argincourt being built. They're worried about the free turrets in that it might not be as survivable as they liked. Because the idea was... If you have four turrets, you lose one, you've lost 25% of your firepower. If you have three turrets, you lose one, you've lost 33% of your firepower. That was the thing. The British didn't like the idea of losing a turret and losing that much of their firepower. So if you have a triple turret, I could see them going with more gun, uh, with, with 12 guns. Or as I did in my actual Maximus design, 15 guns. Purely from the potential of torturing everyone. So at that point, it becomes a case of just 
so many guns! And they're so big! But I do agree that if the QEs are the small tube boiler types and you do have enough for the fire, you do have, even if the, if they've been small tube boiler types and they've been 28 knot ships, small tube boilers and geared turbines is what you need really to get the 28 knots. Um, you would probably be talking and probably be talking about a scenario where the British may or may not have built Tiger, but I doubt they'd have built Renown and Repulse. I think they'd have just built more Queen Elizabeths. Or rather, Queen Elizabeth's batch twos. I think in the night, if you get the battleships up to twenty-eight knots, then the British probably don't go down the battlecruiser route, and then Hood is very different. The Admirals are very different, but the Queen Elizabeths and Renowns and I, I, I don't. There is going to be someone like Jackie Fisher who's going to try and justify building a, ca a battlecruiser, but building a battlecruiser or a thirty-knot battlecruiser in a world where you've got full, uh, full-size battleships doing twenty-eight knots is far more difficult to justify. You're looking at, you'd have to make the Renowns reach about 35 knots to be able to justify them. Now, yes, if you can build a 35 knot Renown, then yeah, you'll have the Battlecruiser. But you need it to have that level of clearance. And remember, that's from a 21 knot battleship to a 28 knot Battlecruiser, that's a 30% speed advantage. From a 28 knot battle a battleship to a 35 knot battle uh, battle cruiser, that's a 25 percent speed advantage. It's going down in terms of the advantage, and also once you're at 30, operating at 35 knots, is going to make a lot of constraints on your design. Fight for a global First Amendment. I think the two biggest opportunities for the Queen Elizabeth were not having small tube boilers and reluctance to develop triple turrets. Um, Fisher, 1906, to be honest, and some triple turrets, I'd power research the 18 inch guns. Oh, that is a step away. That fits with the Argencourt timeline, it doesn't fit with the Queen Elizabeth timeline. And that's why I often sort of I, I hold that back. But again, I even agree with the triple turrets, honestly. If you'd had the triple, if you'd had 12 15 inch guns. HMS Warspite, a small tube boilers, geared steam turbines, and 12 15 inch guns, HMS Warspite becomes a nightmare in two world wars. I mean, even more than she was. You also are starting with a far, far more powerful ship to begin with. You're starting with a true first battle, a fast battleship. A 28 knot ship would be the true. Let's put it this way. The reason why I think they drop back to being called Super Dreadnoughts and the Orions is Super Dreadnoughts to me for the Queen Elizabeth is because they don't achieve this level of being the true first fast battleship. Whereas if they'd achieved that 28 knot speed, they would have been the true first fast not, uh, fast battleships and they wouldn't have been called, wouldn't be called Super Dreadnoughts, they'd be the fast battleships. And from that point on, you'd have fast battleships as your phrase and that would be it could change a large chunk of the world history in terms of development of ships. Well, at least for the next 20 odd years. Because again, you've got the Americans going, well, in a world where the British have a battle fleet which is 28 knots, they've got to make, they're, they're going to have to make their fleet, they're going to not want their battle fleet to be quite so much slower than the British. Because if your battle, if their advantage, if their battle cruiser's advantage over their battle fleet is the same as their battle fleet's advantage over your battle fleet in terms of speed advantage, then you've just handed them the battle because they can decide when and where they engage, how they engage. It doesn't matter if you have more guns, if you have more armor, they will pick the time of engagement, and every single time they want to, they will be crossing your T. Because with a seven odd advantage, they will dictate every single thing of that battle. And the Americans notice. So the Americans would probably push their speed, either their fleet up to go, right then, 7 knot advantage gives them this, 3 knot advantage doesn't. So we just need to push ours up to 24 knots. They might go for 25. So they can still have the preponderance of guns and armor which they enjoy. It's going to change Washington, definitely. Nice to go, everyone. Uh, yeah, given the speed definition of fast battleships was always going up because of each generation of battlecruiser, you really cannot tell the Queen Elizabeth class super dreadnoughts uh, called uh, the Queen Elizabeth class super dreadnoughts fast battleships. 
not really going up. Fast Battleship wasn't really going up. It doesn't exist. And it comes in at roughly 28 knots. When battleships can do 28 knots or above, then they're good. Steve Clark, it should be obvious that your national defense spending depends on your national focus. Britain is a maritime nation, so needs a navy more than an army. Nothing has changed in centuries. As a continental power, Germany uh, Germany has no option but to spend most of its budget on land forces. How Germany and the Kaiser had illusions of grandeur, much like the short French chappie 200 years earlier. And yes, I know his average height for the time. And this clearly makes the point it, would be cl it was Clara Cuckoo thinking about a Kaiser in hindsight is a choice that makes no sense. The song says you have to know when to fold them and hold them and when to know when to fold them. Josh White. I'll try to play a bit of Devil's Advocate. Thank you, Josh. The real problem with the German naval building spring wasn't that it took place, but rather that it wasn't integrated into a larger grand strategy and set of policies. I agreed. There were understandable reasons to build a big navy if you were Germany, such as its use of diplomatic bargaining chip or the ability to protect overseas trade as the German economy continues to grow. At the same time, Europe is relatively peaceful during a lot of years of the of the building spree. The great powers occupied in other areas. Russia, the Russo-Japanese War, and then rebuilding. Britain with the Boer War and Imperial Maneuver against Russia. So it was a unique moment in time when Germany could afford to prioritize the navy of the army. Obviously, the strategic situation eventually changed. Russia's attention turning back to the West and starting a massive rearming program, and the French following suit which necessitated the German doubling back down on the army to allow a counter the threat of the Franco-Russian alliance. But the initial idea wasn't completely crazy. Martin Peacock. Josh White. To nitpick slightly, the idea of Germany building a large navy is not, as you say, a bad one. The big issue is that there was no clear reason why it wasn't being built. German battleships always come across as vanity projects. The Kaiser wants them because that's what first-rate powers have, not understanding the why of why Britain has a, in particular has a large navy. Turbis, on the other hand, seems to want to show that he can beat the British at their own game. Again, though, he seems to not understand why Britain has a big fleet, because there's no clear reason as to why Germany needed a big battle fleet that led to the problem you mentioned. That it was not integrated into any larger grand strategy. Instead, it seemed to exist to exist, and no fault is paid by anyone to, uh, uh, by anyone out to pay to it by anyone outside the navy. Martin, uh, Steve Clark, Martin Peacock and Josh White, some, uh, what, what, somewhat valid points, but consider the following alternative timeline. Krupp still makes the exact same number of 11-inch guns, but 66% of them mounted on rail carriages as support for artillery for the army. Maybe they're still manned by naval personnel. Remaining 11-inch guns go into shallow draft ships designed for actual actions in the Baltic, much like the British cruisers later in the war. The German Navy still have to make the Blucher, as class of heavy-armoured cruisers, again designed for working in narrow spaces of the Baltic. The new steel from the now never built high seas fleet and some concepts go into serious set of fortifications in Alsace. Germany go for the squash the Russians like a bug strategy in 1914 whilst holding the new found debt de fortifications versus the French. Now I can't determine how well 3 million French will fare against an est uh, and I estimate about half a million troops in deep fortifications between 1914 and 16. But we now uh, we know attacking without adequate resources never goes well in our own timeline. Russia is certainly almost uh, certainly out of the conflict by 1916. What happens in the West, not sure, but not invading Belgium means the French are on their own. There is no RN blockade in North Sea, and it is unlikely the Fra Italians join the French in 1915. And of course, it's unlikely that the British are allied in, in are in the alliance if Germany's not building a navy, because then Germany's no threat to Britain. Germany's not building a navy, there's no threat to it. Mum Peacock, in answer to your questions, rubber guns are well and all well and good and when you know that the railways will be go going close to where the fighting is. As soon as you move from your own uh, from your own railways, that becomes a lot harder to ensure. There is a reason Germany attacked the Belgian fortifications with guns like Big Bertha and not railway guns. The tracked super, ha uh, super heavy howitzers and guns can move with, or with, uh, with your army much easier. The Br two, the British ships were ocean-going ships with design features allowed them to operate in the Baltic. If that is what you're suggesting for the Germans, then okay, but there are still issues. More below. Free for what purpose? A fast relatively lightly armoured ship operating there in confined waters is rather vulnerable. Again, however, more below. Four, this runs entirely counter the German army doctrine, which is to avoid fortifications. I can't see this happening and would also be very expensive labour intensive. Something that negates some of the advantages of not building the high sea fleet dreadnoughts. Again, five again, this runs counter the German military thing at the time. The whole reason the Germans went west is that France, or the French would be ready a lot faster than the Russians. It also ignores any possible French response with the building of the German fortifications you mentioned. With no German naval build-up, France can build fewer battleships and has option to produce its own super heavy siege artillery to deal with the German fortifications. That can be slightly problematic for Germany if their forts fall and France is invading Germany proper while the majority army is involved in invading Russia. Firstly, as mentioned, the LLCs were not designed for the Baltic. Large light cruisers, 
They were ocean-going ships with design features that allowed them to operate in a certain part of the Baltic during wartime when other parts were mined. This is namely the Orosund between Denmark and Sweden, which had not been mined but was very shallow. That is the only reason the large light cruisers needed their shallow draft. The rest of the Baltic is fairly deep, so any of the capital ships built could operate actually in the Baltic. Little issue. As I say, it's mainly getting into the Baltic that is the issue. Secondly, agreed, it is always the issue of getting into the Baltic. Or out of the Baltic. Or basically through the Baltic. But it's the Baltic is an issue. Secondly, Germany does not have a need for a reasonably sized fleet. They do have, does have a need for a reasonably sized fleet. They do have overseas colonies and ocean going trade. A combination of cruisers and armor cruisers to protect the trade is perfectly viable. Backing those trade protection vessels up with a reasonable sized battle fleet is actually quite sensible. There are reasons for Germany to build uh, to possess a battle fleet as well. None of these would have been an issue to Britain if the ships were designed in such a way to allow them to fulfill that role. As it was, the German fleet did not meet those criteria and were positioned in such a way as to be a direct threat to Britain. America was largely la was laying down battleships every year, but Britain was never concerned about them. The reason was that the American ships could be justified very easily by America's need in global position. Specifically, America has too long coasts it needs to protect as well as some colonies, the Philippines. Because of that, the slow but heavily armoured and armoured American ships make perfect sense and not a threat to Britain or Britain's position. Exactly. And it's the same when you start looking at the British build-up versus the Americans. It's a case of the Americans understand the British build-up and understand, understand, are prepared to accept it being quite so massive it is because they're looking across and going, you're not building against us, you've got Germany as your issue. Yeah, we're not worried. You guys, because look at this. Look at the sheer number the British are building versus other people. At no point is America having a panic build at the time because of that. No, they, they know the reason the British building is because of this country. They know that's going on. They're not worried. Thank you. 12 15 inch 42 sounds more likely as the gun foundries would have had more experience with that gun than an 18 inch gun, and clearly, in, in time, the boiler tech improved. The trouble is, and I'm probably going to be saying a similar comment at many points, and so I might not repeat more. The trouble is, RN knows the USN is pushing for 16 inch guns from late 1911. A qualitative rather than quantitative race might have less aggression, but it's still important to the RN to win. An 18-inch gun battleship, even if a one-off in its build run, might be enough to win it, or most likely achieve the first of the competition cap. And if they had four triple turrets being built, surely they'd have been perfect for the courageous class, I think I've said this earlier, given, uh, giving them the necessary six guns to make them really useful, as well as minimum three guns desired for accuracy. Basically, you need the minimum three guns to actually hit a target. It, that, that's the British worked out. Six guns is better. Six guns is the minimum you need for really salvo long range firing, which is why they don't like the courageous and the courageous class because they have four guns, and it just doesn't make sense. It's one of the interesting things is when you put up the hit stats on achievements of the courageous class versus the renowned class, and it's just such a big difference. You sit there and go, "What? How? They're the same guns. They're the same turrets." How's this? Oh, literally, it's just one more turret, and it's the six guns, and it's the fact they're able to achieve use use the four turrets with their four with their two or four guns to adequately range before they engage the stern turret. Nice around. The only thing the British got wrong with the Queen Elizabeth class was the not getting all six Queen Elizabeth class super dreadnoughts and the three Arcadia subclass Queen Elizabeth class super dreadnoughts as three Canadian Queen Elizabeth class super dreadnoughts would have been very useful in World War II and would have provided jobs in upgrading the infrastructure in Canada and strengthen Anglo Canadian ties more. Yes, but the sheer amount of infrastructure you would have to build in Canada to do it is immense. And as been said by a few other people here it, in comments previously, it's a massive debate, but ultimately nothing comes of it because no one wants to. The, what you'd have to build whole ports. Halifax, as it is today, would have been had to be completely rebuilt to be able to support those capital ships because they would need new dry docks, they'd need new construction facilities to build them, launch. You know, uh, the entire thing would have to be built up. The Royal Navy would have been far better off with three extra Queen Elizabeth class superdreadnoughts rather than four Iron Duke class superdreadnoughts and a tie class battle cruiser. That's also been very rubbish. The once the Japanese and the Kato and the American Colorado's are built, the four Iron Dukes and that Lone Tiger are really no longer viable in frontline warships and only last as long as they do because they get a stay of execution because of the need to make up numbers. But the thing is, those are being built before the Queen Elizabeth class are. 
And frankly, if the British had eight or nine Queen Lazus plus the five Revengers, two Renowns, and Hood, then the four Iron Dukes and Lone Tiger would have to go. Uh, if the British had nine Queen Elizabeths, I doubt you'd have the. F the thing is, if the British are building that many Queen Elizabeths, then the argument of we want eight starts to ring a bit hollow. You've. It, it almost becomes as the accountant's trick will be to order two more Queen Elizabeths. So you'd end up with maybe eight British Queen Elizabeths and maybe four Canadian ones. So you'd end up with 12 ships. That's better, but you know, life is life. Plus, you have to remember the two renowns are made up of three R's being cancelled. Hood is an entirely later on ship, and yes, you're right, it's better to have the standard ships, but yeah, the eight or nine Queen Elizabeth plus five Revenges, two renowns, and Hood, that and the four Iron Dukes and Lone Tiger will have to go. Yes, that's great. You can, if you build all that, that is brilliant. You Actually, you probably had the yards to build it. There are many benefits to getting more Queen Elizabeths. Um, the Canadian benefits if they get the free, but that's if they're allowed to keep them. Um, the British do pretty much standardise on the 15 inch guns until the Sir King George has come. Um, the, the 13 and a half inch guns would just get. Disappear. Hmm. So, Martin, Matthew Keeling, as regards to the 18 inch guns, is it possible the guns themselves are being developed as replacements for the by this time particularly antediluvian 100 ton guns of Gibraltar from Malta? No, because they're being developed as ship guns rather than land guns. You can tell that in their patterning. Um, there is a possibility you can be used for both, but it, you, if you were developing a gun purely as a land gun, you develop it differently than if you were developing a gun as a ship gun, which can be used as a land gun. It, it's going to be a difference in how you approach the entire mechanisms and organ uh, and breach and things, because human the space you have on land is far greater. In such a situation, only stabilization system of them would be uh, would be being developed speculatively with companies who are accurately accurately reading the room when it comes to technology race and deciding they need to be ready for the next jump when it comes. It's a lot more than just the stabilization, but I, I can see where you're coming from, but no. I can see the logic in not fitting the Queen Lizard, barring Archicore, with small tube boilers, as such cannot uh, such cannot be guaranteed to be available when the ships need them to be there, and the RN needs to stay as close to the schedule as possible. Flirting with coal firings, uh, firing for the Queen Elizabeth at any point after the concept work, much less during construction, was just dumb. I've been over this. Before you have the investment in infrastructure for oil in the UK, then, frankly, if you're the Royal Navy, which can you rely on? The supplies of Welsh coal or supplies of oil you may or may not import from abroad? Which can you rely on? It makes sense to, uh, in, to an extent. Um, once you've got the oil... Then you've got that, but you almost need to be able to. Yeah, the trouble is, the Queen Elizabeth now at that point are too far along, so it's 900 tons of wasted, wasted that they could have actually used for different things. The R class and Agincourt should have all had oil fired small tube bows from early in times. Agincourt does seem to, the R class don't. Hence, the Renowns don't have small tube boilers, but somehow small tube boilers are magically available, a large number of them. Well, most of them, not all they need, but most, not all they need are available for Courageous and Glorious. It's amazing. Um, should have had all had all the fab boilers from very early in the design phase. The boilers can be guaranteed to be ready by the point these ships need them. As you mentioned, the move to small tube boilers is not going to cause um, too much of a fuss when it comes to the tech race. And you'd want the Queen Elizabeth to have them, but the numbers race of the Germans is a more dangerous, expensive one, and these ships essentially cut, cut their race off if, they're not, if they are not delayed. Pretty much it. Modern Peacock. Okay, this is a nice long. Okay, there are four comments in a row. They've all maxed out the word count, so this is going to be a long read. Hello, Dr. Clark. In answer to the question of did the Iran Navy get it right at the class, well, I don't know as I still have some questions. I hope you're comfortable as I feel this is going to be a long one, even by my standards. It is but I'll be replying as we go. 
Firstly, I hope you can forgive my lack of references. I appear to have lost all of most all of my Nether History books moving house. In fact, the only book I have left on battleships is Professor Friedman's British Battleship 1906-1946 on Kindle. Please note your book is also on Kindle, so I still have my copy of that. Because of the unfortunate situation I find myself, I'm relying entirely on Professor Friedman for this. But from memory, there is nothing that is massively different from what other people said. No, but I'm not always quite sure about his analysis of the British battleships. First question is on the time and Professor Freeman makes mention of a memo sent by Church of Lloyd George, Chancellor of Time, discussing 1912-13 building plan. In that memo, Churchill claims the plan is for three battleships and one battlecruiser. Professor Freeman claims the battleships will likely repeat Iron Dukes, given the price suggested. Now, during the live, you mentioned how the RN liked to operate the battleships in groups of eight, and it is my understanding the fleet flagship was separate from the squadrons. Uh, with the RN having... Not really, but... No. Yeah, it's... They usually... Uh, the fleet flagship in German parlance is separated from the squadrons. In Royal Navy parlance, it tends to operate in within a squadron. Um, with the RN having 22 battleships, either complete or under construction, so adding three more battleships to these would complete three full squadron of dreadnoughts and add a fleet flagship. A quick side now. Now, I can understand your point regarding the fate of the older battleships of the Royal Rangers, in particular, but I must respectfully disagree. The third battle squadron of the home fleet at the start of World War I was made up of the King Edward VII class battleships. These were all sovereign types. Yes, but this is. Okay. These were all sovereign types ships still being, uh, still being suggested. I believe that the RN would have kept the 12 inch ships around for a while yet. Yes, some would have likely ended up in either reserves or perhaps in the Mediterranean fleet. I actually think that the reason would be to show the Germans that the building race is over. It would essentially be saying, look, we have a four squadron fleet and we have for the 15 inch gun ships. You can't compete in numbers or technology. Yaren would want to know that statement of fleet at, la at least for a while. Now back to the Queen Elizabeth. Now the point I'd make is the reason they were actually looking to deploy them was because it's a far more complicated scenario. Again, whilst we can look back and we have the advantage of going, you can just focus on the Germans. The British can't. And with Japan's build-up, yes, they're building far more powerful ships. And with the South American build-up. And with the scenarios you have going around the world, spreading some of the British dreadnought capability around, the older dreadnoughts around, actually makes a lot of strategic sense from the British perspective. This is what they were to an extent discussing. I'm not basing this out, drawing this out of nowhere. There are ideas for it. Now, you have to remember that with the growing threat in the world, a lot of the scrapping of the pre dreadnoughts has actually slowed down, and they are uh, everything's modernised and everything's put in place, but the reality is those ships could have been called back. As I've already discussed, so I'm not going to go into that too much detail. And again... If you were talking to the Germans, they would not differentiate between the British fleet and the British Empire fleets. They would consider them all together, so you'd still be having your four squadron fleets. But you wouldn't have to pay for it. Now back to QEs. War was, as, uh, QEs. War was, as you point out, in both the video and live, I believe, seem increasingly likely. The Iron was having fairly conservative organisation, not without good reason. Adding 15-inch guns to the existing fleet would appear to be a logistician's nightmare. Yes, the ships are likely to be based at home, but can you guarantee that? Far more sensible course of action would seem to be to finish the fleet the RN has, then move on to the next step following the year. I'm missing something here. I don't feel I am, and that leads to my next question. You are missing something. I'm sorry, you are missing something. In that the memo sent by Churchill to Lloyd George was an opening statement. The minimum they could do was the three battleships and three repeat battleships and the battle cruiser. The minimum. And he was basically setting out a minimum. And I know where that's coming from as a basis point, but that is a minimum of what they need to add on. And basically, the, com uh, the the solution to take is the four fast, uh, the four super dreadnoughts as they become, because then you don't need the battle cruiser, and the battle cruiser is much more expensive. Plus, the fifteen-inch guns are important, as said, from the perspective of the Americans are building fourteen-inch guns. We know the America, we know the Germans are starting to research bigger guns. They can't be allowed to jump ahead. We know the Americans are researching 60-inch guns. We need to do this. We need to take our pace up because we can't allow... The British have a problem in that they always have to be at the front. When they're the ground... 
there is this phrase which Terry Pratchett puts so well in one of his books. The problem with being the best is you always have to be the best. You can never not be the best for a day. And if you rely on being the best for your living, for your security, for your safety, the biggest, the best, all those things, you have to always be the biggest and the best. And that's one of the problems for the Royal Navy after the second after World War One, because they're not allowed to bring in the next generation of ships, and the Americans and Japanese are sixteen inch gun ships. And that's why Nelson Rodney are so important to them, because they're not they are they are in second place. They're not the biggest. They don't have the biggest guns. And it's 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 a really strange thing to put it on because we don't really have a situation in our personal lives where we sort of see, come across this day to day unless you are but most people aren't but it is the scenario they're dealing with now my next question is on the actual design of criticism. you may mention them being at least 900 tons overweight if not more but due to no I didn't they're not 900 tons overweight then 900 tons of 900 tons was considered wasted because of space allocators things that had to be were put in originally to support coal which then had to be changed to support oil so uh, I'm not sure if that misreads going back to professor Freeman, he makes mention the initial design based weight of the R class being in the 27,000 27,500 tons not in exact terms uh, later on when talking about the queen some of the work Danny court carried out Post their trials, it stated the speed attained uh, corresponded to the desired 25 knots at 75,000 chart horsepower at 27,500 tons. Given the Queen Elizabeth actually displaced around 32,500, uh, 22,590 tons, what happened? I'll admit that the 27,500 tons seems far too low given the speed size. That seems to be the um, standard displacement range. Uh, given the Queen's. Uh, uh, given the speed, size, armor, and armor carried, even so, allowing some growth to five thousand ton difference seems massive. It wasn't five thousand ton difference. It just wasn't. Um, I also find it hard to uh, justify given something. So uh, there is something uh, missing. So Philip Watts is not a bad designer. I can't see him getting things so far off without some sort of expression. Yes, designs grows they have worked on. Else than twenty-seven thousand five hundred time design almost certainly seem represents a starting point rather than end or even middle point. The problem I come back to is why was Denicott basing speed calculations around twenty-seven half thousand ton weight? I don't think he was. The only things I can think of are that design was changed to reflect a new weight and reduced speed was accepted, or that was, as the ship grew in size, the engine power was not increased as well to maintain desired speeds. So both of these have problems. However, the first big question, why or was that not documented somewhere? Even in a note to Denicott from Watts, the, first, the second seems very unlikely. As, again, so Philip was a good designer, as was Denicott. Now, a combination of bad timing and poor communication could be a factor. Now, when I asked in the live if there was any possibility there was some possibility that the RN could have been made had an incorrect assumption on the speed of Queen Elizabeth, you put that to bed fairly quickly, making the point that the narrative of construction was letting people know. That would seem to work against the assumption, unless the corrections came later in the build of Queen Elizabeth. Not really. The main problem they found, and you have to remember, they originally designed for 20, uh, supposed to aiming for 25 knots. Well, they aimed, hoped, aimed for was 28 knots, right? Then they're accepting 25 knots because that's what they think the ceiling is. And when you realize that basically when you're dealing with fast uh, uh, fast battleships and you're maintaining it, you're looking at A, small troop boilers, but also B, geared turbines to achieve the efficiency necessary for it. And when you're talking about that weight moving on it. And once you start working down again, you look at the risks they had to take. They're being very conservative. They're trying. They're applying a lot of power, but they're being very conservative in what they're using to generate that power. And so, twenty-five knots is always the realistic speed. Now, it ends up differentiating because when you've got the fifteen-inch uh, armor and you're uh, you're adding on the thirteen-inch armor belt, etc., and all these things extra in, it does have an impact on speed and also it's gonna sound strange but they don't quite get the hull shape right if you consider the faster ships are the slightly longer ships which are also have a slightly modified hull 
and their sort of Warspite Enco slightly faster than their predecessors because they are slightly modified in their hull shape. And then Argincourt was going to have an even more modified hull shape. So I think those things are all factors. Third question is that the Queen of the Class seemed to have been rushed forwards. Why? Along with the argument I made the first question in the Reef Fleet make up, there is also the point you make about small tube boilers and their possibility of it. Um, because there's a naval race is going on, this is it's not a rush. It's, there is a pace of movement going on because of the race. If there was a desire for small tube boilers, the Royal Navy had other options available. They could have waited a year to give more time for small tube boilers to be ready. It's a very nice option for you to go with, but if they wait a year, do they have any guarantee that small tube boilers are available? And they've given up all that building time. You think about that. If you don't aren't building ships and you aren't utilizing those yards, a those yards like the London yard, the London uh, Iron Works might go bankrupt, but also you've just given up all that potential, that construction time potential you've got available. That's your other big thing. Do, are you willing to give up the potential of these ships? And also, that means those ships definitely won't be ready for any war, which could be coming soon. And that's your other pace. If there is a, you know, as you pointed out earlier, there is a threat of war coming soon. You want to get the most powerful ships you can in the water as quickly as you can. The alternative is to build a one-off ship with the small tube boilers, the rest being free repeat Iron Dukes and more ships following the year, following year. Both of these options allow the design of the Queen Elizabeth to mature more, the second one less so, I admit. Instead, what we get, to me at least, is a picture of a design being pushed through too quickly. While the back and forth on coal versus oil and the seemingly impressive and massive weight gain. If the answer is simply the Iron wanted to end the building race as quickly as possible, which it did, then it seems fair to ask why. Because it wanted to end it. Think about this. If you end the naval race, you end the course of ten the, the main reason for tension between Britain and Germany. If you end the main reason of British tension, uh, tension between Britain and Germany, and Germany ends up pulling back, you open the you open the door for rapprochement, rapprochement, you know, friendship, which was already the British were trying to work on. Which means you can get out the Entente, or rather, you can t uh, the Entente, which is just a friendliness can be even more of a friendliness of neutrality in war versus Germany rather than aiding Germany. Or beneficial neutrality to the French. Because you don't have the reason to go to war. Unless, of course, the Germans do invade Belgium. That's, that's an issue. But it's one of those scenarios you could... You have the option, if you end the naval race, of defusing the situation. It's worth some haste at this point. Now, with war seeming likely, it could be seen as an attempt to avert war, but it could also be argued that it was not too much of a it, that it was too much a focus on the building race and less on preparing a fleet to fight the war, war that looks possible. That's the job of the second Sea Lord and the first Sea Lord, and they're doing their jobs quite well. I can't help but feel that while you make a very compelling case that there is still a lot missing from the story of the Queen Elizabeth, there is a limit to how much time you can get into it. Uh, if I remember correctly, the video, the lo long patrol was 80 minutes long, roughly. Give or take a few seconds. Uh, the live is three hours, and it's this is not a book. This is not the 100,000 word book, which I could probably write. Edit, I forgot about this point. The seeming rush of the Queen Elizabeth and subsequent lesser designs See, it does leave them open to be surpassed by other designs of warships. We can see this with the Italians and the Francisco Caracalla class. Those ships, if completed, would have been what the Queen Elizabeth class could have been and would have left the RN an interesting question in the tech race. The feeling is, again, the RN had rushed ahead to get the Queen Elizabeth out the door, so to speak, but had not considered long-term implications. They had. I think that's where Argincourt comes in. I honestly think the more and more I look at Argincourt, the more and more I think of her, she's going to have small tube boilers, she's going to have geared turbines, and... Six 18 inch guns is my gut instinct. Although today I did a Twitch stream and I tested out the maximum length of hull that you could make that hull, and I managed to fit eight in four twin turrets.
if 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 that was what was done, that would have been a, a, a tremendously scary ship. Um, but again, the RN, you have to remember the RN is dealing with a lot of factors. Uh, you can't think of the RN as just balancing against the Germans or even just thinking about the Americans or also thinking about the Italians. And also there's the fact of we know the paper we know the paper stats of the Francisco Caracalla. Well if you look at the paper stats of the Queen Elizabeth as they were planned versus as they were delivered. The Francisco Francisco Caracollas are gorgeous and I love them. But they weren't delivered. So we don't know how they work out in reality. Also, there's the odds that by the time they come into service, the British will be delivering their third generation of 15-inch battleships, if they're delivering them. They could be working on bigger battleships by that point. Ships with bigger guns, or uh, all sorts of things. So, you, there, there is a very real possibility that the sheer pace of construction of the British means that the Francisco Caracolas, as good as they are, surpassing the Queen as they do on paper... When they actually in the service, there is something bigger, meaner, and nastier than them already in service or coming into service with the Royal Navy going, Hello! And there might already be Argincourt in service with six or maybe more 18 inch guns to go, Hello! We can be friends! Thank you for doing this live and this long patrol. I really greatly enjoyed both, and they gave me a new perspective on the view on the Queen Elizabeth's form. From should you ever get round to the book of and would like an extra bit of help and research front, I'd gladly get help anywhere you can. So I'm sure you guess I'm rather invested in sort of these ships. I would love to. Look, what I've decided is I'm currently working on four books. Two for my series about third sea lords and directors and construction. And two classes, the flag class and the U-class submarines. I have got ideas of what class I would do after that, what two classes I would do after that, and what two um, DNCs I would do after that. But I'm, I, I, well, DNC is a DNC and an admiral. Um, I'm gonna probably, I am probably gonna keep those two the same. But the ship classes, there are a lot of people pushing for Queen Elizabeth class. But the thing is, if I do that, that's gonna be a very big book. And that's going to be a lot of budget, if that makes sense. So what I need to do is I need to make sure I've got enough. I, I, I've. It's going to sound the strange. I make sure I have to have enough income coming in that I can make the books I am working on currently as good as they can be. So they will earn enough money that I can then put uh, put that money into the next four books, of which the most of it will probably go into that Queen Elizabeth book. And there are a few of you offering to help with it, which will be very useful. We'll see. Cheer guy. It looks like Nevada's belt from the stats thickness, uh, varying the thickness from 8 to 30 and a half inch gun. Uh, half inch. Was the Queen Elizabeth belt a uniform 30 inch belt? I didn't think the all or nothing armor scheme was a thing yet. Uh, Q belt was 6 to 13 inch. It depends on what level of belt you're talking about. The main water, uh, the water level belt, or the subsidiary uh, support of the belt above, etc. People often think the belt is a uniform structure the whole way up, and it's all the way long. But no, there'll be the belts, and there'll be forward and aft sections, and there'll be the upper belt and or casemate, and also a lower belt sometimes as well. And the belt is not uniform, even on battleships. It just covers more on battleships than it does on battle cruisers. But I'm going on H Botanical. I think I signed more Drakenfell, but the more I think about it, I'm not sure. In fact, I think you could both be right away. My position for a while was that there was, has been that the RN needs to form a squadron out of the Queen Elizabeth. They aren't really fast enough to work the battle cruisers in Jutland to show, and at, fi and at five ships are both literal and figurative on a number. They are too many to easily fit in a squadron, with some slow dreadnoughts, but there aren't enough of them to form a cruiser strength squadron like Duncan's and Canopus. Your argument for a 28 knot 6x18 inch gunship is compelling, but even you admit it does not fit easily to Queen Elizabeth's sort of fleet. The battle cruisers are an option, but that seems like a waste given how powerful the ship would be. That was why I went down the route of thinking a triple 15-inch guns at around 25 knots from small tube boys for Argincourt. The next year would see three more repeat Argincourts. That would give a squadron of Iron Dukes, King George V's, and a squadron of Avengers, and a squadron of Queen Elizabeth and Argincourts with one ship left to be flagship. That would be a very powerful... ...had. That allows the Orions and 12 dreadnoughts to be seen uh, and sent to other fleets to reserve and dominions as you suggested. Okay. 
I'm going to read the whole comment, then I'm going to read the response, and then I'm going to start talking about it, okay? The problem I have left with from my, is from my understanding the 1915-16 financial year was going to be another four-year ship year. I think I'm right in that, uh, in that, so that, what would the fourth ship be? Well, I used to think another battle cruiser, as none would have been laid down since Tiger. Now, though, I am not so sure. Perhaps the four ship would have been the 18-inch gun true fast battleship, for the reasons you suggested. I know I just wrote off your origin call work with the battle cruisers, but as an interim solution, it makes some more limited sense. I wonder if HMS Argincourt would have ended up being whichever ship design was ready first. The only problem I have with my theory is that it mean, means the direction of the construction are working on two different capital ships at once. They're often working on three or four, so that's fine. Your thoughts. Edit. Sorry, one thing I thought to include is possibly laying down your qualitative leap and then moving away from it, uh, allowing US the chance to lay down their own 18 inch gunships. That has the possibility of leading to another mini build race. Yes, the American, British American relationship was much better than the Anglo German one, but still, one wrong step and you find yourself back to square one. This was another part of why I thought Urgent Cold would have been a 15-inch gun ship. Delay the 18-inch gun ship, still a ship a year, then the, um, then the year after, lay down the one with the battlecruisers, say. You can guard against being leapfrogged in numbers a game, a game but whilst showing that you aren't going to massive numbers of ships. <sighs> okay, right. So my response. I know where you're coming from. That was a... I'm going to have to reveal a lot more than necessarily I wanted to do about Argent Cold to answer this question. You see, you're trying to make squadrons, which is neat, but honestly, from the launching of HMS Dreadnought, because it became a wood light to have, rather than a guiding light. I see it as the Queen Elizabeth win the qualitative race, a qualitative race with Germany. The Orange knows the USN is developing 16-inch guns, has known it since 1911, and yes, the USN are standardising a 14-inch, but preparing to jump to 16-inch. Now, a qualitative race, that can be won, or more accurately, capped, at least for a while, by a one-off. So, building a one-off HMS Arjun Corp 18-inch guns, as the 6th Queen, uh, Queen Elizabeth does that, because even if the USN do upgrade their fleet build to 16-inch, as opposed to the RNs, thanks to the R's de facto standardization on the 15-inch, then in terms of image, which is the most important thing for a qualitative race, the British will still have won, as they have an 18-inch gun ship. And even if the USN ends up building one, then they're always, uh, they always have been the second to it. Plus, the advantage of building just one rather than set of them is it lays the marker early and makes it only one ship. It will not provide a rallying cry for the US Congress to get worked up about. Plus, Japan couldn't hope to build such a ship themselves at the time. The Italian industry was already straining far behind their capability to design. Consider it an attempt to save money by either in ending or nullifying both of the dreadnought naval races of the same class. That seems like a couple of potentially big, ga uh, fairly big gambles there. The idea that Congress won't get worked up about only one 18-inch gunship for Argent Corps, firstly. Uh, while I understand the argument, my counter would be that Congress has just, uh, has just seen Britain build one HMS Adrenaut, and then ten years later Britain has 35 more, including HMS Argent Corps. And how are they reacting? If we go into this, how are the Americans reacting? The British are building a huge number. Then there's Germany, France, Italy, America. This is 1912. America's going with a constant pace of construction. I could see the possibility of Congress authorizing Argent Corps at the same rate they're authorizing dreadnoughts, so two a year. Not a major issue, but the RN has to lay down three ships to catch up to the USN, then things have possibly got out of hand, if the RN has to. What the RN would probably do if the Americans lay down, start to lay down two a year, well, the British can easily match that. Again, the British have a huge infrastructure base to draw from, so they can match that without any problems. And by the time they would also, the Americans would have to have a run-up. They wouldn't just be able to go, "We're laying down an 18-inch gunship ourselves." They have to build the 18-inch gunship. They have to build the 18-inch gun first. That's going to take time. The British knew about the 16-inch gun from before the Americans even announced it to the public. The British knew about it. They knew they were working on it. So. Expect the British to learn about their 18-inch gun just as quickly. In fact, honestly, there's probably the intelligence network, but it goes through the engineering network far quicker. And so, by vice versa, back to the Americans. The Americans are probably getting it just as quickly from that intel about from Britain as they are as the Americans are Britain's half from America. The second, though, admittedly less concerning gamble is the idea that Britain getting the, the 18-inch gun, fir uh, gun first wins the tech rate. The USN respond with a Super Colorado of 18-inch guns, basically a South Dakota, but 8x18 rather than 2 12 times 16 And the claim would be that, yes, the Iron got the 18-inch gun first, but we got it properly, assuming a 6x18 about Argent Corps. That leads to nothing but, uh, being resolved in a continuation of the race. 
Yes and no. Uh, you see, the thing is, the Americans can make that claim, but the British... The Americans often have more guns on their battleships than the British do. The British would go, yes, but ours is faster, or, the, you know, that would... It would have to be... Not only have the more have the more guns, but also be faster. It would have to be an out and out winner on every calibre. But if it's just got more guns, the British would go, yeah, yours always have more guns. Good luck catching us. We'll decide when we fight. H.M. Sergeant Corps would like H.M. Sergeant Corps would likely been laid down before Pennsylvania was being launched. That means the RN has leapfrogged the 14-inch gun twice in quick succession. It has the potential to go to work the wrong way. I tried to think in terms of things like squadron logistics, as it's very easy to get stuck in a game of top trumps. Trying to think about how the ships would be used and fit with, well, within the wider fleet. The Iron is a global force, after all, and some consideration has to be paid to how they would operate around the world. It just seems unlikely at the time, surely? You'd hope so, but it's not really actually impacting the actual design and construction decisions. Um, the reason I say that is because, honestly, if we consider Drenot herself and what she's followed by, they they're not making it up to a squadron. They, they get to ten ships, and then they're building, jumping into thirteen and a half. And then they do build fours and fours, which is good, but they're very quickly jumping away from that as well, and it's it's just, it's a constant war, it's a constant, almost nightmare. And if you consider the Queen Elizabeth, originally four were being ordered, then they added on one. And then they added on another one, which is the Argent called a sixth one. And it's all just a kind of it's uh, it's to an extent a bit of a mess. And the mess is because there's the navy making and the navy were asking for eight originally Queen Elizabeths, and then they got cut down to four, or just four and we'll do four more next year and it was a case of add on two to add on one and add on another one uh, order Argent Corps but that Argent Corps decision is made after they've already ordered eight revenges because of the we want eight campaign and it's it's partially politics it's partially industrial capacity it's partially just a scenario you're in but here's my explanation of my points Gamble, Martin got gambles not as much as if they waited. You see, when she's laid down, whilst intelligence and open source information suggest the gamble the 15-inch Quinnellos has done what they wanted to do, the Anglo-German quantitative race, which has provided the island cover its massive construction rate, with other nations still still going on. Remember, it's not one until those ships are actually in the water. Being laid down is great, but until they're in service, it's not being won. If they wait, they lose that cover, and the qualitative race becomes more obvious both in public and politics. But whilst the quantitative race has some heat left in it, they can cap it by playing into the Tillman fear. Yes, he's the most well-known, but not the only congressman to espouse the idea that battleships are just going to keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger, with bigger and bigger guns, as well as bigger and bigger price tags, taking money away from other things. It's a one-ship gamble, which at worst means the USN either has to abandon the 16-inch for 18-inch, or redesign their ships, or at best cause a massive debate in Congress and the USN funding to stall for a few years whilst they sort themselves out. More so, it probably narrows down the qualitative race, even if it eventually continues, to the RN and the USN, which would make both their lives easier. It is a gamble, but it's not an, unfor it's not an unreasonable gamble. Carl Pennypacker. Honestly, just on face value, the Revenge class feels like downgrade compared uh, and downgrade compared to Queen Elizabeth. I understand the need for the more 15-inch guns more quickly, but honestly, I feel like those resources could have been used for better ships. Maybe even using the small tube boilers for these. Sure, it delays their construction, but then you have the prototype fast battleship. I admit I'm not too well versed on the Revenge and Queen Elizabeth. But on face value, I look at the, I look at the Revengers and ask why. Politics. Simple put, politics. And honestly, it's basically. We've got to build eight, and we want to build eight at the best budget value price possible. Because we've got to build eight because of the politics. So the We Want Eight campaign is great, but it doesn't get doesn't get the Royal Navy funding for eight more Queen Elizabeths. If it had, if the R Revengers had actually been Queen Elizabeth Mark II, they probably would have had small tree boilers. Maybe not geared steam turbines, but probably would have had small tree boilers. And um, that would mean the Revengers would probably now be considered the amazing ships. Paul from Chicago. The Queen Elizabeths are revolutionary for 1912. There is no doubt that a nation could would build something like them. However, in 1912, only Great Britain has the capa was capable of it. 
only sheer the infrastructure and technology to support the Queen Elizabeth. The Queen Elizabeth class is not a new concept in the way that the Warrior or Nautilus were. Hmm. John Fisher, a weakness I think you're missing about Nevada and Pennsylvania class is that they have triple turrets as opposed to free, inch, uh, free gun turrets. And their cage mast is another weakness in their design, as history has proven. Now, my response to that is, the trouble is that quantitative race is waged in the stark reality of numbers. A qualitative race is waged in the image appearance of technological superiority. So we know the realities of these ships' capabilities, but if you consider many of the prominent papers of the day had not been that long ago confidently predicting Russian victory in the Battle of Tsushima due to a number of guns on the Russian fleet outnumbering the Japanese, the level of information is not that great, and so qualitative races are about the image you're pushing forward. Do what? Bully for you, Teddy Roosevelt, bully. Was unaware of the British of that British propaganda. Thank you. Was aware of American propaganda, but maybe it's not reasons fully. Not as reasons fully. Uh, do what? Uh, the gun selection part is interesting. Fourfold is there actually correspondence on this? As I've answered a couple of people, there is correspondence in terms of personal discussions going on. There is no. I can't point to it in minutes. Discussion. That sort of scenario going on. And in the correspondence, it's to an extent inferring from some of the discussions points. It's making a logical inference from what they're discussing without mentioning. Because it's always sort of America is the other power they're watching. Because they like America and America is friendly, but they also do know there is a risk of a qualitative race that it can turn into a quantitative race. And whilst Germany doesn't have the funding or the industrial capacity to do so, America does theoretically have the industrial capacity to do so, and also the space. Sir Richards, I'd like to see your timeline to build up the, the, the RN getting the 16.5 inch Queen Lizards. E.g. Dreadnought, 14 inch triple turrets, KG's 15 inch triple turrets. It's nothing so massive, as said, choosing to develop the 16.5 inch rod and 15 inch would make that change. They do a real jump of three inches rather than that, not down the often stated guns three inch larger than those of Dreadnought, which speaks to their superiority as long as you don't remember the 30 and a half inch gun ships. As for the triple turret, it just needs one of the battle cruisers to be built in that way. Something which is often considered as a way to increase bank whilst decreasing weight in proportion. That's the really interesting thing. That there is a real possibility that the big cats could have been built with triple turrets. And if the big cats had been built with triple turrets, that changes the scenario quite dramatically in terms of getting those in the construction. And then I put in, so, uh, five days ago, so as this I think could become an ongoing comment generator, first I wanted to say thank you for watching it, and it's after the comment response video comes out on the, well, planned on the 24th, planned to be today, but it's actually coming out on the 25th. If you respond to this pinned comment, I'll try and respond if I have the answer. And I said, if the Canadian goes for the Arcadia subclass, the Greenland's class, sub super, class super dreadnought battleships, how much infrastructure would have been required? And if the infrastructure was probably maintained and upgraded, does this not help British in World War II? Well, of course it does if it's up properly upgraded and maintained. Although this is the Canadian government talking about, they do have a habit of rotting their whole ships out. As for the infrastructure, they'd have to build um, dry docks, slipways. You probably need at least one dry dock, if not two dry docks, that could take them. You probably want at least one or two slip. Uh, you need at least two, probably two slip ways to me and maintain a drum beat, and then you're going to need the industry to produce the steel and the armor. Your plate you're going to need. Boko Disraeli. I feel like the Queen Elizabeth were appropriate step on the dreadnought ladder, and while in hindsight they're coming better, they were a good decision as could be made at the time. The Isles though were aggression and should have been the QEs fully sorted out. Agreed, Boko. Gee, guy, it's the 18-inch gun put in Furious, and possibly originally intended for Queen Elizabeth, or the same that was going to be utilised for the G3 and 3 designs. Not the same, but was very similar parameters, just it's a 40 cal rather than 42 or 45. And even the power of the 40 cal was too great for the Furious's framing, and it was cut down. We, as I said, there are many points people made that the guns on Furious looked like they'd been cut down. And... The 40 cal was too powerful for the framing. This shows you that Furious was neither designed for the gun nor the gun designed for Furious. Sid others. I heard that even even during the height of naval building, there were shipyards in the UK going bust due to lack of orders. Was it true? Yes, it was cut for the industry and not helped by Churchill playing favourites to some yards. So the UK was winning the numbers race without even trying. Yeah, it has what happens when you as a country have been investing in the requisite infrastructure for that long at that level. John Evans. 
Don't forget the Dreadnought Invincible both reduce the number of large hulls being getting ordered as compared to pre-Dreadnoughts and Armored Cruisers too. Yes, it's actually a step down for the British in terms of construction numbers. Mega throw. Twitch streaming counting us live to get more Ambrew. Brilliant. Bit of rule lawing, uh, the lawing, uh, uh, lawing there. And well, yes, about those to be counted as well. Before I grant you that, where can I watch the VOD? The Twitch streams go live at the result. There is a link in on the top of this. On, on top, there should be a Twitch somewhere on the channel page. Um, comes out on YouTube on Wednesday. Uh, you, uh, the UAD off on Fridays comes out on YouTube on Wednesdays, and the strategy games. Um, uh, it comes out on Mondays on the YouTube channel. They're usually recorded on Sundays and Fridays. It's fun. Atrius Verdun. As a two pennies on the premise, I think the Queen Elizabeths do the role that they were built for very well. They are ships that are produced the same numbers in the class level as the Orions, Iron Dukes, and King George V's, with plans for more. As the Germans are on a 12 inch gun for the year, it's, it is a good bet. It's taking Dreadnought to the next level and going, yeah, we built one of them and gave you time. Can you really pay for the next evolution of ship turpets? You already got two or three new changes to naval laws through the Reichstag, but the Kaiser has limits on his patient. He wants things done quickly and those ships aren't cheap, plus he needs his army. The 15-inch gun is an escalation, but because it's 8 guns, not 10, it's not too threatening to the Americans. Who can put more guns on the ships? But it's not an escalation Congress is scared of, and the US Navy might even like being able to play, get to go, hey, look, Congress, the Brits are building this, can we have two ships better? than them to show we are number one. The US isn't that bothered about the speed because doctrinally at the same time they want a speed fleet uh, speed fleet for a battle line engagement so it doesn't make Congress think we need to escalate. The French Allies, the Italian battleships of the time are nice but only 12 to 12 and a half inches at the time and the response is similar to QE's. In some ways the RN might get a lot, might like the other nations to go up as it lets them respond with getting triples though maybe a 16 and a half inch or jump to 18 inches. From a World War II perspective, would triples have been better? Yes, and at the same time, as with the small tube boilers, if you get them to a 27, 28 knots. However, that means we go down the rabbit hole of alternate history. Much more powerful, and maybe the next iteration of battleships goes up a notch, and they are the same place as the power on the power curve. I feel maybe the RN context, the Queen turret, if the sh ship was built more efficient, uh, efficiently, might have been the thing to do, so, and take it back up to 10 guns, and wouldn't leave people jumping as much as 12 guns from triples, uh, particularly in battle line era. Those boilers and guns cost money, and whilst the RN gets money, there is limit even to them from the government. Therefore, I think the QEs are compromises between what the Navy wants and can get away with on the political tightrope, but very good ones. Within the winning naval arms race is a very big payout from the ships. The service they provide in both World Wars also suggests and proves that they were good fundamental design. Much as I love Belfast's war spite, really should be, uh, Belfast, war spite really should be there instead. Also, aren't they pretty? Just look at right, right even with both funnels, uh, after even more so. Hmm. Apologies for somewhat long comments for the format. It's just I had some uh, some form for this class. So even as a kid, they were the, uh, the uh, that's what a battleship should look like, along with Iowa's and the QEs were a record since getting back into naval history in lockdown has made it more so for me. QEs are good. They are good ships, and thanks for the comment, Mervadon. Duke of Petrington. In my mind, on the same hull form, three triple 15-inch gun turrets, it would meet the most reasonable firepower about disturbing and disturbing the Yanks too much. But it's a free turret design. You would be able to fit more boilers, fuel, machinery without removal of the fourth turret, and it's barbette. Jellico would have pushed for oil, fire, and some small tube boilers. As for numbers, 16 plus 4. 16 paid for and built for the UK, 10 of which would go to RN, free to Canada, and free to Australia. The plus 4 is 2 paid and built in Canada, and the same as Australia. This would, uh, this would with invest on naval and shipbuilding infrastructure, to both dominions. Also built 5 to 10 renowns with free triples as massive middle finger to German battlecruiser fleet. Jellico was able to grab every Admiral DR in time to sit down and discuss how the Queen Elizabeth class should look, he would. I think that's, um... That's more of a fan... I don't want to say fantasy fleet, but a, um, a alternative fleet scenario than what I've been sort of looking at. Uh, the triple turrets, and I love the triple turrets, and I'm always pushing the triple turrets, and it's the big question I do on the side is, why didn't they go to triple turrets? But, the argument basically goes down to survivability of the guns. In terms of, you lose a turret, and as I've recently had quite a happen, quite a lot in UAD, uh, UAD turrets can go boom up, um, you've lost X amount of percentage of your firepower. 
if you have three turrets and they're three triples, you lose one, you've lost 33% of your firepower. Now, if you have four turrets, you lose one, you've lost 25% of power. So, four triples, I can see. I don't see them dropping down below four for a battleship. Not until they get to the Nelson and Romney. And even then, that's just because of the Washington Treaty Limit. They really hate that. And that causes all sorts of issues. And then you have the King George V class, and they're sort of going, No, we don't like that either. And honestly, the fact that the King George V don't end up somehow being built with two twins and two, uh, and two quadruples just to make them happy, I do not know. Ah, uh, Street Racer, I, I love your idea about us dro stopping drinking Iron Brew, but frankly, that ain't happening. That's my advice. I'm sticking to it. John Evans, this is a really long comment, and one of the reasons why I put off re-recording this all to today. John Evans, I enjoyed watching this one whilst I was stuck in hospital for a few days. I'm sorry to hear that. I'm not sure I agree with your figure on displacement of QAs. I think there is a late 20s, early 30s figure. Design displacement was 27,500 tons, and that figure is given a Washington Treaty, which means 1922. That's not their design figure. That's their sand displacement. Um, they're about 28,000 to 28, 3,300,000, 28,500 tons. Normal, depending on feed water. Mm, no. Uh, whilst I acknowledge the R-Class design outlines includes T2, a, T, a, a, T2, a 10 gun ship a la Nevada, I boring expect the Argincourt would have been one of the X design series, so better secondary layout, non-tapered armor, maybe small tube might have been able to table, but I, I doubt you sure, uh, sh the sh you make shaft horsepower increase to make 28 knots on a ship the length that actually suited for 25. Okay, all right. This is going to be repeating a lot of what I've already said on other people, but in the nicest way, John Evans does do the do the uh, the stats properly. So this is going to be quite a lot of engineering chat. I think it's different. This was my response then. I think it's different. Displacements causing the difference. The standard displacement was 27,500 tons, but when they were designed, the terminology standard displacement didn't exist. However, I hope you're feeling better. Anna meant, in terms of the course, she was going to be longer than even long batch of Queen Elizabeth, and with the increased power of the same volume in terms of space occupied, but far more efficient and powerful boilers. I think 29 certainly becomes possible, but interesting point. It made me check my rough sums again. Jones, if you have details on length of article, that would be very interesting. I've never since uh, I've never seen uh, since anyone on her since past note of C had been ordered but not laid down. Queen Elizabeth was designed as twenty seven half thousand tons with six hundred and fifty ton oil as legend fuel level, so standard uh, could be reduced to twenty six thousand eight hundred and fifty. Then you would need to subtract that's not the standard. The standard limit as they describe in the Washington Naval Treaty is twenty seven and a half thousand tons. I, I know where you're getting the figures from, but those are figures which are not quite to the case. Then you need to subtract any RFW and anything you could claim as peacetime fittings. I guess it comes down to how overweight they were. But the Washington Treaty Declaration of 77,000 tons declares not very since there isn't much liquid weight to strip out. Even two-thirds ammo isn't going to be 1,000 tons different. Uh, let's go through. What are you pointing out? <laughs> Um, they're 27, oh, that's Washington Naval Treaty, is there, okay, I have those stats in that Excel spreadsheet, so I will get that set up and I will check that before I start talking about you, so I'm literally checking my, uh, my various stats of ships for Queen Elizabeth class, 27,500 tons. The R class are 25,750 tons in their standard displacement. So there is two f 1,750 tons difference between the two classes. Okay. Now. Royal, and then you've gone on John Evans with the Renan Repulse have done completing at 29,200 tons versus 27,700 ton design. Um, they are standard, standard, standard displacement, they're listed as 26,500 tons. Standard displacement. I think 
there's a difference in the figures going on here. And I was talking normal displays, and you're, I, I'm not sure the, the figures are coming out different. Um, these are the figures I'm going on in the standard placement are the standard placement as the British declared in the Washington Naval Treaty, so as they officially declared. Also, it's not just the small tube boilers you ideally need, the geared turbines that are debuting in the last two Calliope class. Yeah, but look at the date lines when they said the Calliope class are ordered. Uh, John, I mean, looking at some trials data from, uh, from Malaya on uh, deep uh, displacement of 32,966 tons, she was clean, less than a month out of dock, full power, run for two hours, average output 57,332 uh, shaft horsepower, 23 and a half knots, overload, two hour run, 76,074 shaft, uh, shaft horsepower, uh, design was 75,000 shaft horsepower, 25 knots. For 28 knots, I would expect the ship to be in order of 50 to 80 foot longer, otherwise you need a big increase in shaft horsepower. I'm feeling that it would be a ballpark around the 10, 100 to 105,000 shaft horsepower mark. Right. Geared turbines are also part of my theories, part of the changes. Usually the RN adopts the changes in freeze and technology, and my thinking is 18-inch guns, geared turbines, and small tube boilers are the changes for Archicot. You could say having free turrets around 4 or 5, but honestly that's not really tech change, that's a form change, because all those things then appear elsewhere in the war very quickly, even large ships, especially the stuff which appears for Krajus and Renown. Combine and Renown class. Combined, 48 boilers, 36 small tubes and 12 uh, small tube boilers and 12 geared steam turbines. Of which it seems 54 boilers, 24 small tube boilers and 4 geared steam turbines were already available or under construction. Now, the 3R class battleships, then the Renowns, are that the Renowns are drawn from account for 54 boilers, but they don't have geared turbines or small tube boilers. So using that to infer 18 small tube boilers plus geared turbines uh, uh, geared tur uh, turbines gave the Courageous class 90,000 90, shaft horsepower, 24 such boilers, plus geared turbines, would therefore probably grant approximately 120,000 shaft horsepower. Now, this is an approximation. This is me doing approximately. It could well be 110k. But I do notice that that's not far. Your figure was 100 to 105,000 shaft horsepower, Mark, and the figure I'm getting is over that. But let's be honest, if we were being conservative, probably about 110,000 shaft horsepower. Which is 55,000 shaft horsepower greater than the Queen of the Class had. Added to that, from a couple of sources, we do know Warspine and Barham were already 196.2 metres, the rest of the class is 195. And Agincourt has been described as longer than that. I think from what I've learnt, I'm reckoning about 200 metres. There are people who I've talked to who have looked at the, uh, the various things that they reckon it was she was going to be about 210. I think 20 knots is about right, especially as I expect them to have refined the hull form a little more. They say they seem to with each batch. And please note, I'm being very careful about source lists because whilst I want to share this journey with everyone, I also want to be, this to be part of my book on Jellico. Uh, that is the thing. Jellico is one of the people I am writing for as the, uh, as Third Sea Lord. I'm right, uh, one of the books I'm writing currently on Third Sea Lord. Uh, that's in the least written stage because I want to go to Newcastle and do sort of archive researches and if any book holds up the publication of the four of them it will be that in fact I might end up instead of doing four at publicating a publisher starting off by publishing four at once actually just doing one and then doing another one and another one in terms of the publication of serial because of that one and because of it being held up by going through research and I don't want someone to get too much of an advantage should they try to publish it before me Whilst I'm still technically playing the academic game, I, well, I have to accept the rules, despite wishing it was very different. Jones, when we talk about length, it's useful to know what length we're talking about. What is length overall, waterline length for, uh, between the particulars? A length waterline, uh, uh, waterline length de varies depending on draft, of course. Uh, I understand research must be a painstaking process. Overall length is what I'm comparing there. I'm listing the overall length because that's the stats and details I have. Uh, unchanged LPP. Um, they had all roughly the same bow angles to stern profile, so, the ch so that changes as well, although I must admit I'm being conservative on Agicor's length overall. Um, some think as high as 210 metres, but that seems to be a massive growth, and at which point the hull, if being left unaltered, could accommodate four of the scale up to an 18-inch turret. That is the real scenario. If they have gone up to 210 metres, then she's she's probably, as I tested out today, in the um, in Twitch and what you'll see on Wednesday if you're just watching on the UA on the um, YouTube channel, she's eight twin turrets. 
That's a scary ship. Anyway, that is the last comment so far. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed, and I'm sure you're going to have lots of comments and discussions, and I hope you enjoy it. I hope you found it useful. Take care.